in September. The trout fishing season is almost over, but for the river fly fishermen, the best is yet to come perhaps because now we're starting with the grayling season. This is the Lower Hodder, my favourite grayling river, and here the grayling are now just coming into their prime. Brown trout spawn in the back end of the year, which is why their close season runs from October through till March. Grayling spawn in spring with the coarse fish and therefore they come into season officially in June but then they're not in very good condition and reach peak condition through autumn and into winter. So now we can turn to dry fly, nymph and wet fly fishing for grayling and explore the flies and the techniques used to catch these wonderful fish. Any time now there will be an autumn hatch. I'm expecting today pale wateries, few blue winged olives, perhaps the odd autumn done, perhaps a few sedges and the grayling will rise. And so what we're going to do, we're going to try and deceive the fish, no matter what insect they're feeding on, with what is a fancy fly, a fly that imitates nothing. One of the greatest dry grayling fancy flies, beautiful little artificial fly, imitates nothing but grayling love it. So here we go, this is as traditional as you can get tie this one on and the knot I always use is the tuck blood knot bring that back always wet the knot when you're sliding it tight I would never say that this was the best knot it's a good knot take the waist off in centimetre lengths and because this fly is not made of cool the canard in a dry fly we need some floatant in this case this is gink which i regard highly as a floatant i think it's a wonderful floatant gink uh, and you can sort of rub it in to the tail tiny amounts not a lot so here we have sturdy's fancy it imitates nothing at all uh, possibly a little beetle or some sort of lamb red insect but if you look at it I don't know many insects I don't know any insects that have got a, a bright red tag at the end and yet grayling love that red tag Sturdy's fancy invented by Mr Sturdy on the Ewer over in Yorkshire now we'll try it on a Lancashire River the Hodder I'm sure it'll catch we fished through one little bit of fast water and I'd refuse when fishing dry or emerger to hammer a piece before the hatch really starts so I've just moved a few yards downstream to another little run a bit of fast water and again I shall go through this methodically with this fly now So let it follow around, no need to worry about taking it off too soon, it's still drifting quite nicely. False cast to dry it, in it goes. Now a fish has just moved, so I'm going to go straight to that fish. I don't see, I didn't see what it took. This is a better grayling. Now, if I bring it to you in the net, and we'll show you some features of the grayling. Here we've got a small grayling that will be in its second year. Features to notice are the lines of scales along, big scales which trout don't have. Trout don't have scales as big as this, they have tiny scales. And it's because of these lines of scales that the fish is called grayling or gray lines. The other feature about it is that the mouth is under slung. You see that? Which means it's a bottom feeder primarily. And if you look at the pupil, 
of the eye, you see it's slightly pear-shaped. Now the pear-shaped extension on the front is called the opaque space and is an adaptation for feeding on the bottom because that increases the light uh, uh, entering the eye, enables the fish to see better. And then if we lift up the dorsal fin, the dorsal fin is this spectacular thing. Now this is a small grayling and you can see the dorsal fin there which is spotted with black and a very dark uh, maroony red colour. In a big grayling, we'll ca we'll, you'll see one later on, that is even bigger. Perfect little, beautiful little wild fish, that's the grayling. And its scientific name is Timalus, Timalus. And if I go, I can smell wild thyme. The interesting thing about grayling, when it feeds at the surface, is that if you cast a, a line straight upstream of it, so that as the fly comes down, it rises, that under slung mouth will not take the fly. What happens is the snout will hit the line and the fly will be pushed away before the grayling can take it. Consequently, you get rises sometimes if you're casting straight upstream that don't hook dry fly. Therefore, the ideal thing with grayling with a dry fly is to catch far, cast far more across, even slightly downstream, so that the fly comes down first, the grayling can take it and then go down with it. Two other points that are important for grayling fishing. The first one is that grayling, when they're taking dry fly, tend, not always, but in the vast majority of cases, rise from the bottom to take the fly. Whereas trout will often hang under the surface film to take the fly. So you've got to give plenty of drift so the grayling has time to see the fly and then respond by rising. The other thing about grayling is that it tends to be a shoal fish and live in the open water. And so if you find a shoal of grayling in the middle, you might take one after the other, after the other, after the other from the shoal. Trout, very rarely you get that with wild trout. Usually wild trout are solitary feeders sitting by individual rocks or underneath the bank.